the Minister of Culture came up with this idea. We're going to have the competition. So we're going to pay all the bands more money than they would get if they played for a party. So the first carnival after independence, they had panorama. It was the first panorama. The history of steel pan, it's, it's a big question depending on the, the, the depth you want to go into it. Eh? I mean, there are aspects of the history of steel pan that are common to much of the history of the, the music explored by the African diaspora in the New World. So it's, it's part of a tradition of people who came here without instruments, met a whole musical culture, and they were either using instruments they encountered and playing them differently so they could play their their different music, or improvising completely new instruments out of whatever was to hand to make music that sounded like what they felt music should sound like. So Pan was part of that, but it was, it took that a bit further. It started off in the, the, the 1930s, and it sort of, in a way, it grew out of the bamboo bands. They have it in parts of West Africa, they have it in Haiti, where you're stamping large bamboo on the ground or you're knocking it, a purely percussive rhythm making ensembles and people would be singing to it. And around the 1930s, first of all, you began to get bits of metal being introduced into the bamboo, mainly to replace the big bass bamboo. That was the ones tall, about say five feet, partly because they got destroyed quite quickly, you know, just beating on the tarmac, but also they were inconvenient, you know, you're a bit drunk and you, you smash that down on your foot and your toe is broken. But also, it made the ensembles move very slowly. It couldn't sort of perambulate all over the city and so on. It'd stay here and it would take an hour to go a hundred yards. But in the 30s, there were big changes, cultural, sociological changes, even political changes taking place. You know, there was the growth of trade unionism, the rise of the organization of the working class, and all of these changes. One very big change that I found, and I speculate was part of what inspired Pan, was that the generation of people who created those first iron bands, you couldn't even call them steel bands, they were all metal percussion ensembles. Most of them never played bamboo in their lives because bamboo, they were tended to be too young. There were very rigid generational gaps, what you were allowed to do if you were 14 years old. You couldn't go here and do that and so on. Very hierarchic kind of colonial society. Hierarchy not just being class and race, but also even gender and age. That group that invented, that, that came out with the first pans, was the first generation that did not speak the, what was the lingua franca until then. It was the French patois. They only spoke English. And what that meant is that they were cut off from the folk culture, the working class folk culture of their parents of the older generation. They were pretty much kind of stranded on their own to create their own culture. And the 30s was also when um, jazz, swing music became big. It, 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 affected, they had a profound influence on Calypso, which was the Trinidad folk music. No longer you had a more Hispanic sounding kind of music of quattros and guitars and violins. Now you had trumpets and saxophones. It's brasher, it's louder. Volume was very important. So all that happened and was absorbed by that young generation. Once they realized that, yeah, you could be different bits of iron and get a nice rhythm, they went for it. There were no no musical tones in it as yet. Those are what you call non-pitch instruments. But it doesn't mean to say there would be just one single tone. Anything you beat, if you, if you beat a, a piece of wood, depending on how you hit it, you could get more than one tone. But there was no idea of having a particular pitch. There was certainly no idea of um, different instruments having any harmonic relationship to one. You played what you got. But once they had discovered you could get different tones, Different bands, different groups try to outdo one another. So they began to see it, well, if we could get two tones, maybe if I do this, I could get three tones and sound better than them. So there was this competitiveness between different organizations. And whereas the earlier bamboo bands, they were seasonal. Carnival is coming up, a bunch of us, we'd go and cut some bamboo and we'd form and we'd be there. No big set of rehearsal was necessary. And then after Carnival, we threw them away and that's it. The organization was just ad hoc. But when you began to get steel bands where people are now trying different things and you get people 
making pans and you make a particularly nice sounding one, you don't just throw it away, you keep it. And the bands became sort of perennial. They lasted throughout the year. So again, whereas the earlier percussive organizations were ad hoc, they didn't have that tight bonding, the primary groups, the steel bands began to develop that. They began to develop a perennial identity. So they, had a, they all had individual names, mostly taken from the movies. You had invaders, and your bands get desperados, and so on. The earlier Tambu Bambus didn't have names. It's just whatever district it came from. There was no particular unique name. Now, in terms of the music, they moved from playing rhythms to playing more complex rhythms to playing what in, in technical music term, musical terms you call an ostinato, which is a repetition of some notes that becomes a rhythm because of its repetition. One of the greatest popular musicians of all time built his whole career on that. That's James Brown. He was so brilliant and so obsessive about it. I mean, he's a person who has made a huge hit that has no melody. It was a big hit. I think it was 1970, I'm Black and I'm Proud. It's just pure rhythm. And, and I mean, he's drawing on the preacher tradition of the US and the screaming and the shouting and the, that driving rhythm. So. The steel band moves, in, moves into that phase. But the, the musical environment, what they are, these, these young men lived in, was not that environment. It's not the environment of the, the, the black American church. Their musical environment was the musical environment of dance bands, which were swing bands, brass bands, playing popular music, in some cases playing Latin American music, mambo and so on. But these were bands with saxophones and trombones and, and things like that, uh, acoustic double bass. And the pan men wanted to be able to play that kind of music. So very early on, they started to roll, to try to get sustained music, the sustained notes that a saxophone can give you. Once they had reached that stage of wanting to do that, they were faced with the, the problem of musical knowledge. Generally, 99% of them had no musical background. And if you are in an ensemble, once you have moved away from pure rhythm, you're going to need musical knowledge. How do you harmonize? You begin to have issues of playing in the same key. Once they began to face this challenge, they fell back on the people of the society who had some musical knowledge. And in most cases, not all, but in most cases, it was the girls. Girls, even working class girls, certainly all middle class girls would have had piano lessons. All of the steel bands, somebody's sister, somebody's aunt, somebody's mother, somebody's cousin was a girl who knew about piano. So the piano became the instrument they would begin to tune their pans to and where they would begin to learn the rudiments of harmony, of key, and so on. I mean, it's interesting that in that way, the pan was mentored by the piano. Even though they were, they were leaning towards wind instruments, the, the brass instruments with their sustained notes. And that's why you began to get all of these women who were formally trained in music. They usually would come in when it comes to playing classical music because males in Trinidad tended to have nothing to do with formal training of music. If they were learning an instrument, they tended to go for jazz, improvisation. They were not into notation. That's a very recent phenomenon. By the time they arrived at that, they had moved away from the vocals and they had become a purely instrumental music. And um, again, the competitiveness between the bands, it not only pushed them musically further, it became a physical competitiveness in the forms of gang warfare. And I have to say, it's, it's, it's my theory, because people tend to equate the gang violence of the 40s and 50s to the gang violence you could get today, you know, the, the street gangs who fight over turf. And I think that's absolutely wrong. That's quite incorrect. The only thing they have in common is the fact of violence, which was a symptom. But the cause, in the case of the steel band, was a very, very different. And ironically, the cause of that was the same, on the one hand, competitiveness, but on the other hand, what I mentioned earlier, about the same bonding, it was a form of love. You fight someone from my band, my whole band is going to jump on you. But when that happens, your band is going to jump on any member of my band. I spoke to many of these pioneers, and they would all say, yeah, we fought, we, we damaged one another terribly. 
and I can't say why we did it. That was another aspect of the competition. I mean, the competition pushed the bands musically further and the instrument uh, technically further, but also created this violence that developed a social panic against steel bands. And the steel band men always talk about that. Parents, once they hear, hey, my son is in a steel band, it licks for him, and no one wanted their daughter going out with, with, with a pan man. Even though there was this ostracism by the parents and the, the, the authorities and the police, Pan was like the rock and roll of Trinidad. And if you were a young man and you had two pan sticks in your back pocket, you got the girls. And that's the other aspect of it, because it was so popular. So those were the forces at play that pushed Pan further. Um, the ensemble became more complex. Once it became musically more complex, you got the division of labor. You got people who were making pans now. The early days, everybody made their own thing because you just take a piece of metal, maybe a pound it with a stone. But then you got tuners, and then you got arrangers or composers, and then you got people who play one pan but not another pan. Some bands went the way of improvisation. Invaders tended to be good at that. But again, once it gets too big, you, you can't improvise. So. There was created, I think it's the late 50s, what was called the bomb competition, which is an informal competition. It was informal at the time. It was created by Trinidad All-Stars. When bands met on the road, each would bring on their best tune and play and try to show that our tune is really better than yours. And if when we're going, we could take the crowd away from you, that's it. So there was this musical competition that who would get the crowd away and so on. Neville Jules decided one year he's going to I suppose literally blow them away. And he took, a, I think it was a minuet in G and arranged it for Calypso Tempo. And he came with that. And the bands were just, wow. And that started the bomb competition. They would confront one another, very often in front of the police headquarters, and they would drop their bomb tunes. They started with classical music, but then they, they just drew from whatever. Come Independence, 1962, there, there had been a sort of big, Sunday night steel band competition. But the big bands, the, the most popular bands did not play there because they made more money playing in parties. And the, the steel band association and the, the Minister of Culture came up with this idea. We're going to have the competition. So we're gonna pay all the bands more money than they would get if they played for a party. And that way we'll get all the, the, the top bands. And we're gonna call it Panorama. So the first carnival after independence, which was 1963, they had Panorama. It was the first Panorama. That clip was an excerpt from an interview that was over two hours long. So if you've still got any questions about the story of Pan, definitely let me know so I can actually take some more footage from that interview and put it in the final documentary. Plenty more clips like this, as well as the full documentary release, will be coming out on this channel. So subscribe if you want to follow along. Next week, I'm going to be with Jimmy Phillip in Chiguanas, who's going to be showing us how pans are made from an oil drum to a completed tuned steel pan. Hope to see you then.